evening. I'm so excited about tonight because um, mapping learning styles is, is one of my absolute, absolute passions. <clears throat> so my background is, I'm as many of you have heard me talk before, if you've been to my webinars before, I'm a coach, I'm a facilitator. And way back in the mists of time, I uh, qualified as an NLP trainer. So I've been using NLP and hypnotherapy uh, uh, for a number of years and use it um, actively with my clients, albeit in a more sort of blended approach rather than being very specific about what I'm, what I'm using as tools. Um, I blend it into the way that I work. So tonight we're going to be uh, exploring some of the tools that I use with my clients, um, and I know that Caro also uses with her clients, um, really understanding um, our clients' learning styles. So just a bit of background before we start. Um, for me, it's really important as a therapist that I understand how my clients learn. Because when I want my patient and my clients or my patients, whoever you, you call them, to actually uh, change something in the way that they actually um, are doing something, it's really important that I understand how they go about changing something. So it's important that I understand how they take in information, how they represent that information that they've just taken in, in their mind, and how they then use that information to uh, change their patterns and behaviours. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is the concept that we actually think outside of our heads. So imagine for a moment that there's a huge big world outside of our heads where we keep our thoughts and our ideas. And you'll notice that when people are actually thinking, they have particular places that they go to actually think. So they look in particular directions, um, and they pay attention to things around them whilst they're actually constructing their thinking. And that's what we're going to be unpacking tonight, because as soon as we can start to map how our patients take in information and how they process and think about it, we can then start to think about how we interact with them when we're setting up exercises or we're working with them. We can actually start to think about, right, well, that particular activity is going to work really well for this patient because they're very visual and they like to see things. So it's really important that I send them some videos so that they can watch those videos and that will help them to incorporate an exercise practice into their daily life. For other patients, it might be, if I send them a video, that's really not gonna work. I need to talk it through with them. So I need to explain it and they need to be doing it while I'm explaining it to them. Or for other patients, it might be, they're actually gonna really need to have it written down on a sheet and they're gonna be able to work through that sheet. So what I'm gonna to do tonight, or we're gonna to do tonight, is um, give you a shortcut into working out which preferred, what your, your patient's preferred learning style. So Cara, can we just uh, share the screen? Yes, um, let me Thank get you. that. <laughs> and well, I thought it'd be really nice for for Liana just to say hello as well. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I'm not sure whether Liana can be seen or not. So um, could you just let us know guys, because um, we, we've had a little bit of trouble with our Zoom. Can you see all three of us together or could you just see the person who's speaking? If you could just let us know in chat. Just one person. Just one person, right, okay. Okay, so if I undo that, okay. Good. All right. So, um, Liana, speak. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm Liana, one of the co-founders of Remote Rehab. I'm really excited to hear Christina's talk today on um, mapping patients' learning styles. I think it's something we do um, during our rehabilitation, but we don't really think about it in this much detail. So it's going to be really, really interesting um, to hear that and then bring that into our practice. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Right, let me go and just share the screen. Okay. Lovely. Okay, let me just go <clears> to... <throat> Gorgeous, go. thank you. So, um, 
just want to give you some sort of context here. So we have our external way of collecting information. So how we absorb information. And we take information in through our eyes, our ears, our tastes, our smells, and our touch. Now, each of us has our own preferred way of doing it. So for some of us, actually, we need to see something, as I talked about before, in order for us to actually register that um, in, our, um, in our thinking. And some of us need to be able to, to literally touch it. I need to get my hands. And you, you hear that in people's language, don't you? You hear people say, I really need to get my hands on it. It won't, it won't make any sense to me unless, unless I can really get my hands around it or my, wrap my arms around it. Um, and you hear people say things like, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to need you to just say that again for me. And it, and it that just really doesn't sound right to me. So we start to get indicators in people's language about how they need to take information in. And what we do once we've taken information in is we create an internal map of the world. And that map of the world is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, um, in exactly the same way as the external world is. So we store pictures, we store sounds, we store feelings, all of those things in different parts of our brains. And when we think about something, we access information in that visual, auditory, kinesthetic, taste and smell way. So if you just slide on to the next slide, Karen, that'd be great, thanks. So once we've taken in information, so we take in our external information through our five senses, what we then do is we filter that information because basically we will be bombarded with information. So information is coming into us in millions and squillions, if that's a word, of piece of information in any moment in time. And so what we do is we use an internal filtering system, which is our beliefs, our values, our memories, and our attitudes to decide which bits of information we're actually going to store. So for example, um, I was talking to my husband the other night and he's auditory. So he, his preference to take in information is auditory. He loves sounds. And I was, I said to him, my gosh, I said, the light in this room is really, it's really different tonight, isn't it? It's, it seems a lot darker. To which Ian said, does it? I can't notice any difference. Whereas to me, because I take um, my information in primarily visually, I'm thinking, gosh, the room's just so different. Whereas for Ian, no, it's not significantly different enough for him to pay any attention to it. And yet for him, the noise of our next door neighbours is massively irritating. And to me, I just tune that information out, not even paying that much attention to it at all. So we, we have a particular preference for what we're gonna, how we're seeking out information, but we also filter it through our values and beliefs. And what we basically do is we do three things. We delete information that has absolutely no relevance to us. So I delete the sound of my next door neighbours, Ian will delete the information about the light changing. We then do something called distort. And what we do is we, we take the information that, we, that we're receiving and we distort it according to our beliefs. So, for example, if I, I have a particular belief that it's always dark in this room, then every time I walk into the room, I will experience what I see around me as dim because it's always dark in this room. And a friend of mine, um, she's always telling me what a dark living room she's got. And yet from my perspective, I walk into that room and think, gosh, this is a beautiful light, you know, really airy room. But she's got a particular belief that it's small and it's dark. And so she experiences it in that way and distorts her information to suit that particular belief. The other thing that we do as well is we generalise and the generalisations are things like it's always like this, it's always like that. Um, these things tend to happen all the time and so we have this wonderful sense of generalisation. Once we've actually deleted, distorted and generalised our information, we have what we call this internal map of the world, which is pictures, sounds, feelings, tastes, and smells that we have as our memories. 
And we store those in all sorts of different places around our sort of heads, if you like. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a bit later. What we then do is we take all that lovely information and we behave out in the world. So that information, that internal map creates a state, how I actually feel. And it also supports the habits and routines that I've developed in terms of my behaviors. So Carrie, if you just want to flick over to the next slide. So we live in a world of routines and habits, and that's why it's for me, it's really important that we understand our patients' um, learning styles, because we need to, we're wanting to, to establish new routines and new habits. And in order for those routines and habits to be established, we need to really understand how people take in information and how they represent that information in their heads. So just want to just clarify a couple of things. So routines are a sequence of actions that we regularly follow. So they're the things, the strategies that we use. So for example, I have a strategy for how I clean my teeth, a routine for how I do that. I have a routine for how I get up out of the chair. Um, and I have a routine for doing pretty much everything that I do on a regular basis because I really don't want to have to be thinking about, so how am I going to get out of the chair today? Or how am I going to brush my teeth? I've got so many other things to think about as a human being that I really don't want to be thinking about. Really simple things like that. So routines are really important to us and, and they are laid down. So of course, when we have a stroke or something debilitating happens to us, um, we've then got to reshape our routines. And we've got to develop a new way of doing things. And that's when, as we come on to it later, it's really important that I know how I establish a routine in terms of how I take in information and how I represent it in my mind so that I can, I can learn something quickly. So routine is a sequence. Habits are regular tendencies. They're, they're similar to routines, but they're just very hard to give up. So I have a particular, I'm, I, when I get stressed, I will often turn to, I'm not sure as many people do, I have a particular penchant for peanuts. Dry roasted peanuts are my particular favorite and I have a habit of when things get difficult and I'm struggling with something, I have a little secret stash of dry roasted peanuts and I have a little handful of those dry roasted peanuts. If you ask me to give up that little habit of dry roasted peanuts, I'll probably say, yeah, okay, but in reality, it's probably going to be very difficult for me to change that habit because it's it's a way of me de-stressing myself. So routines are simpler to to change and habits a little bit more difficult because they're aligned to a belief structure and they're also they've got a whole heap of emotions attached to them. So I'm more likely to be able to change the way that I brush my teeth than I am to soothe myself when I'm stressed. Okay, do we just go on to the next slide then, Cara, please, thanks. Okay, so our role as a therapist, when our patients have had, um, I would, we're talking here about a stroke, but when they've had some shock to the system, we're helping them do three things. One, we're helping them to remember something that they've temporarily forgotten. So um, I have a stroke, I haven't, uh, I can't really remember, how did I used to get up out of the chair? Um, so we might, in some cases, be helping a patient to remember how I used to do that. So you might put your hand on the chair and you might push with your arms. So you're inviting somebody to remember how they used to do something that they've temporarily forgotten. You're also helping them sometimes to adapt. So I can't use that arm anymore. Um, so I need to adapt by using, I can't use my right arm, so I may be able to use my left arm. So I need to adapt what I'm doing. And the third thing is I might be inviting, we might be supporting our patients to create a completely new way. So I've lost all feeling down the left-hand side of my body. And so what I used to be able to do when I was getting out of a chair was to feel that sensation right the way down the left side of my body. I can't do that anymore. So I'm gonna have to create a completely new way of getting up out of the chair. So we're inviting our patients to one, remember, two, to adapt, which requires us to learn um, and make some changes to a habit and uh, to a routine and potentially a habit. 
And thirdly, we might actually be inviting our patients to create a completely new way of doing something. So before we jump into that whole, how do I help them adapt and how do I create a new pathway? I just want to pop onto the next slide, Caro. And just remind ourselves, I'm sure some of you have used this. I know Liana, you've sometimes talked about um, VARP being something that's used in therapy. Um, so we have visual, auditory, kinesthetic, reading and writing. So these are our ways of how we actually learn something. So how we take in information and then how we represent that and how we store our information. But we're gonna just um, unpack it a little bit further. So just gonna go on to the next slide, Caro. So I just wanna understand for a moment, visual learning. So when we actually are learning something, um, visually, when, when that becomes really important, the, a number of things become come into real, um, and I'm going to use the language, focus. So when we're representing it to ourselves in our heads, sometimes if we're using visual, we'll have a movie or we'll have still images. And that's really important when you're starting to understand an, a patient because one of the things that I'll often talk about with patients is, you know, can, can, you, can you imagine yourself doing that? And they'll say, yes, I can imagine myself doing that. In fact, I can see myself doing a number of things, actually. So I can really have a sense that they're running a picture of themselves exercising. Other people might say, mm, no, I can't imagine myself doing that. But I've got a kind of an image of... Um, what I look like after exercise. So I can see myself post-exercise and I get this quite sort of still image of myself, but I can't imagine myself actually exercising in my mind. Uh, can you keep, keep on the visual ones for me, please? All right. um, <laughs> okay, so the size, the, the move is really important and the size of the picture. It's also when sometimes people have their images very far away from them or they have them very close up to them. And there's something here about the size of the picture. So if it's very small and they can hardly see themselves, we can often invite the patients. They'll say, well, it's actually quite a small picture. You say, well, could you make it a bit bigger? And often what we find is that when we change the size of something, it can actually help us to really associate into it uh, more effectively. So we, when we store those images, we store them in black and white or in colour, they're away from us or they're close to us. And as I've already talked about, they're associated. So I'm in it or I'm disassociated and I'm watching myself. So if I'm associated into something, I'm doing it and I'm watching what's going on around me. If I'm disassociated, I'm watching myself in it. Now, when we can start to work with our patients and really fine tune those images that they hold, those images have much more power. So when we can brighten an image up, when we can start to speed something up or we can slow something down, we can really start to impact how I hold that visual memory of what's going on for me. So we'll come back to some of that language in a minute because that's what the, a lot of the language that's embedded into this um, image is really important. So Kara, if we can go on to the auditory then. So if I hold something in my mind that's auditory, then what's really important, and I go back to the example of my husband, when Ian um, recalls something in his mind's eye, he will really, so for example, we might be talking about a conversation that he had with somebody last week. He will remember and uh, be able to talk really confidently about the rhythm, the person's rhythm, he'd say, well, they sounded really quite, you know, they, they sounded a bit distressed. I could really hear it in their voice. Um, and they were really talking so softly. And he can even remember the words that they use, the specific words, because he'll have heard them use those particular words. Um, and tone and clarity of, of sound or, or precision of sound is really, really important. And as you can hear in my language, auditory is not my preferred style because I've just used a lovely word called clarity. And of course, clarity is in visual, whereas Ian would, um, would actually say, well, that's, well, that's a clear tone. Um, he would be talking much more about the rhythm, 
and the tempo and the pitch than he would necessarily about anything else. So he'll notice the speed of, of, somebody, of a tempo. And in fact, actually, when we listen to pieces of music together, I'll be saying, well, wow, that, that sounded great. And he'll say, no, 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 that was really jarring because, and he'll have heard all of the individual notes that will make something jarring for him. So that's auditory. If we go on to uh, kinesthetic, thank you. So kinesthetic is very much about texture. It's a very much about experiencing something um, and actually feeling that. So the weight of something, the temperature, the vibration, not in an, in an auditory way, but the physical sensation of a vibration. The texture, the shape, the pressure. So I'm going to, Carol, we're going to come and talk about you in a second. But when you ex represent something to, in your own mind, you'll actually really feel it, won't you? You'll, you'll go into your body and you'll experience the sensation of the thing that you're remembering. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and we'll come on and talk about that in a minute. So kinesthetic is, is um, where, so for example, a patient, we might be sort of talking about an exercise and it's likely that as we're talking about that exercise, the patient will just go, mm, I, I just need to feel, I just need to feel myself doing that. And they'll, they'll actually completely experience the exercise kinesthetically in their bodies before they actually do the exercise. And for many people who are kinesthetic, if I can't feel it and I can't feel it in my body, then I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be comfortable doing it. And, and they'll, they'll say things like, it just doesn't feel comfortable for me. Um, that just doesn't it doesn't feel right um, and I'm, I'm just yeah it doesn't fit it doesn't fit for me okay do you want to take the next slide please Cara? thanks okay so the first way that we can map somebody's um, where, the way that they represent um, images in their heads is by watching their eye movements now we're going to try this out with Caro and uh, with Liana in a minute but I'm just going to just give you some basic principles. So if somebody is visual, it's likely that they're going to look up to access the image that they are talking about. So in a moment, I'm going to ask both Caro and Liana to think about some things to do with exercise. And we're going to be having a bit of a conversation about it. And we'll be able to see whether their first point is to go up and to visually remember. So Going back to what we talked about a minute ago, they, are, they might be seeing themselves do the exercise or they might be seeing what's going on around them while they're doing the exercise, but they're actually accessing an image in order for them to be able to talk about that image. Once I know that they are visual in terms of, um, or that's one of their, their primary access points, I know that it's gonna be very important that all the language that I use is visual language. So I'll be saying things like, you know, can you see yourself doing that? I just want you to step into imagining yourself doing this. Um, I want you to just see what happens um, around you. I want you to see the equipment. So when I'm asking them to think about doing something, I will be using very visual language and asking them to visualize. Uh, we've got two ways, uh, and this is as if I'm looking at the person. So we're looking at them. Um, and if they go up to my left, as in we're looking at it right as if, um, they're constructing something. So they're imagining something that doesn't currently exist. And if they're going up to the right, they're remembering something that they have experienced and they're running the movie of what they've experienced. If they're going up to the left and they're constructing, they're imagining what something might look like. When we're doing auditory, auditory is, uh, as you can see there, it's along the ear line. So again, um, I've got auditory remembered. So I'm remembering a conversation. I'm replaying uh, something that uh, happened. So I'm actually going, okay, so so-and-so said this, and then you talked about that. So um, in terms of therapy, if, if somebody's auditory and you've given them a set of instructions, they're going to re potentially be replaying your voice replaying the tone of your voice and, and that, that's when the tone of your voice becomes really important because they will remember that tone, they'll remember the pace um, and they'll remember the inflection in your voice 
far more than somebody who's visual who will remember what you looked like and the facial expressions and what was going on around you. So the way that we hold that memory um, will be very different and therefore the way that we remember specific aspects of that memory will be different. The final area is kinesthetic and we've got two ways of accessing kinesthetic. Um, we've got down and to the, the left as I'm, my, I'm looking at it. Um, and that's where we're accessing the feelings. So I might say, um, how did that exercise go for you last week? And again, I'm keeping my, I'm keeping my language really neutral so my patient can really um, f feel that I, they can associate with that language. So how did that exercise go last week? Yeah, I felt, um, I, just, I just felt really um, uncomfortable for quite a lot of the time. And I could feel it in, um, it's happening right in my arm. I could feel all the sensations in my arm. So they'll talk about the experiences that they're feeling in their body. Um, the other thing that they might do is, is they might actually talk to themselves. And now you, if you watch me a lot, I do a lot of chatting to myself. So I will construct, visually access something, and then I'll have a little chat to myself about what I think about it. And if somebody's um, actually having an internal dialogue, you ask them that question, how did you feel last week? Mm. And they might be running, well, that's a really good question. How did I feel? Well, I think I felt like this, and I think I felt like that. So they'll actually start to have a chat with themselves and sometimes they might verbalize that and you might hear them saying it. And other times you'll see them moving their heads and in a way that they're actually having a chat to themselves. And you'll have a look at that in a minute when we show you ourselves doing, doing it. So the first way of mapping and being able to understand how somebody takes in information and how they hold it, uh, represent it in their heads, is to watch their eye movements. Now that's really quite useful when we're doing uh, remote and we're using Zoom because um, I think Liana mentioned it a couple of weeks ago when you were sort of saying that what's been fun is that you can actually watch the patient's eyes and you can watch their facial movements without them feeling uncomfortable because you're staring at them. So I think using Zoom is a great way of just watching and paying attention. Now, what you'll notice with some people is their exaggerated movements. They literally, they'll move their head and they'll actually look up or look down and their head movement will move really quick, uh, a lot. Whereas other people, they might just flick their eyes. So eye movements is one. The next way, if we can just flick to the next uh, slide, Caro, is mapping their language patterns. So we're combining here how they actually, where they're looking um, to the language that they're using when they're describing whatever it is they're talking about. So visual, um, we've already sort of alluded to some of this, but uh, you'll hear a lot of things, people talking about, um, well, I need to focus on that. Um, I'll give that, I'll, I'll have a glance through that. I'll glimpse, I'll look into it, pinpoint vision. You'll hear people using visual language. So you might say, how did your exercise routine go last week? Yeah, it was, it was really good, actually. Um, one of the things that I, I really wanted to focus on, and I spent a lot of time really focusing on last week, was doing, so -so, doing um, some arm repetitions. Um, and as I was doing that, what I really began to notice was what my arm was looking like. You know, I could really see how, when I was really gripping, I could really see the change that was taking place in my arm. Or I was really distracted by... Um, it was raining outside and I really noticed I was watching the rain and I was paying attention to while I was doing my exercise. So you can start to hear in the language how they're actually holding that, that memory. Auditory, again, they'll be uh, using auditory language. So we might ask the same question. Um, how did it go? Last? How did your exercise routine go last week? And they say, well, the first thing I needed to do is I know I had to put music on because it was really important to set the tone. Um, and I really found myself quite distracted by my next door neighbor because they were making so much noise. And I really found that ex doing that exercise routine when there were lots of other people chatting, I found that really distracting because it really affected my concentration. So you'll start to hear lots of um, auditory language. And as I've said with kinesthetic, um, we'll start to hear, well, actually, um, 
I really felt this in my body and um, I, I was experiencing this and uh, this was, you know, I was feeling very hot um, and I was, I was really noticing um, how I was going hot and cold and when I was going hot and cold. Um, so you'll hear a real um, kinesthetic language. Now, most of us have at least one or two preferred ways. So for me, as I've talked about, I start in visual and then I move into having a lovely chat with myself. Other people might start by feeling their way into something and then out through that feeling might then construct an image that they then pay attention to. So I wouldn't say that there's very few people who have just one um, preferred way of doing it. So my sort of way I work with patients is to mix it up a bit and to make sure that I've got lots of different um, whether I've got visual and, and kinesthetic language, or if I know that I've got somebody who's auditory, I make sure that I've got the auditory and kinesthetic language mixed up together. So that's language patterns and mapping them. The third way of doing it, of finding out about our uh, patient's learning, can you split, flip the slide please, Karen? is the physical cues. So um, breathing, voice tone, speech, um, the speech patterns, gestures, and head positions. So uh, when somebody is uh, accessing images, visual images, it's likely that they're gonna speak, um, they're gonna move their head upwards and look at the image. And so their breathing changes from somebody who's looking down and into their feelings. So the breathing patterns change according to head position, but also according to accessing things. So for example, when somebody's accessing visual cues, they tend to speak quicker and therefore their breathing tends to become faster. And when they're accessing emotions and they're accessing exper physical experiences, they tend to, to slow their breathing down, unless, it, unless obviously they're, they're um, crying or they're accessing really um, strong emotions, if they're feeling into their body, they really, their breathing changes because they then need to access into the feelings. So gestures, head positions, voice tone, you'll watch, and as you can see from this particular picture, so you've got somebody who's looking up and she's actually, and we cho I chose this picture because she gives you a lovely example of her looking at a picture um, and responding to what she's actually looking at. So we also know when somebody's really into a particular image because of how their facial expressions respond. So when you're saying to somebody, um, can you imagine yourself doing it? Once they've got that image, it's often likely that they'll nod and they'll smile because yes, I can. And because they're, they're responding to an image that they're actually looking at. Okay, and just want to introduce another aspect. Cara, just, can we just flick to the, the next slide? Um, just, this isn't quite uh, exactly the same as we've been talking about in terms of how we internally represent something. But this is something I think some of you may have come across, which is Kolb's ex um, experiential learning cycle, which just adds another dimension into how people we like to learn. Um, and this really invites us to think about whether somebody actually wants a concrete experience. Have you actually done that before? Do I have a concrete reference for that particular experience? For some patients, you might find that if they haven't done it themselves before and they have no concrete reference of it, then they might find it more difficult to visualize themselves doing something that they haven't actually got a concrete reference for. Or they might say, actually, I can't, I can't feel that myself because I've never experienced it. So I don't know how that feels. So I'm going to find that more difficult. So if they, if somebody needs that concrete experience, then there are some techniques that we don't, not going to be talking about tonight, but we talk about on some of our other work that we do that you can actually do to help patients um, recreate an experience and act as if they've had that experience so that they have a concrete memory that they've created. For some people, they like to reflect on something, so they might need some time and they need to observe something and then reflect on it. 
So you might there be, people be saying that I'm, I've watched, I'm, I'm visual, I've watched you do the exercise, I can see what you're doing, but I need just a few minutes to reflect on that, to take that time, and then I can start to think about how I want to practice it. There's also, for other people, we've talked about conceptualising. Some people find it really easy to conceptualise. And so if somebody like me, I love to imagine something that doesn't actually exist. So I love, um, if you said to me, um, okay, Chris, can you imagine yourself exercising, um, doing that? I'd say, well, yes, I can, but I can also imagine myself doing this and this and this and this. So I love to ad add additions to something I'm imagining. So if you know that your patient is somebody who's really creative and likes to um, imagine, then you've got this really great opportunity for them to conceptualize and to just build on something. Um, and then you've got people who really like to really experiment and try new things out. So it's really useful, I always think, just to hold in the back of your head as well while you're looking at their particular style um, in terms of how they take in information visually, auditory, kinesthetically. Also to think about, do they like time to reflect? Do they like to have a concept and build on that concept? Do they like to experiment? Or do they really need concrete experience of something? Okay, so we're gonna play, have a little play around now. Um, I'm gonna just, these are some of the questions that I'm gonna be exploring. And if you do choose to um, want our slide deck, I'll, I'll put some more questions on there for you to, um, to experiment with. So um, I'm gonna start um, by just inviting us all to come back. And um, I don't mind who, who fancies starting, so thank you. So who fancies starting? Which of, you, which of you lovely ladies fancies having a little go and uh, letting us all have a little watch of your eyes and listen to your language? Who are we starting with? Okay, I don't, I don't mind. You're going to start? Lovely. But I need to spotlight the video so that um, so people yeah. can see. Yeah. Okay, just checking. When you speak, Chris, I don't go away. <laughs> Good. Do you not go away? Good. I hope not. Does everything so, look okay? Just check yeah. for the audience that um, I'm actually the one who is spot lit. You can see, you could just pop in chat just to say that you can see me all the time, even when... Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Right. So... What we're going to do is we're going to, and, and it'd be lovely in the chat, guys, if you could just make a note of what you're actually um, having a look at um, and what you're, what you're noticing Caro do and also what you're noticing in terms of her language. So she's got, I know she feels on the spot now. Don't you? I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I'm, I'm just stare thinking, at you. Yeah, which way do I go? What do I do? <laughs> lovely. So what I'm going to ask you to do, Caro, is I'm just going to ask you to think of a time um, in the last month when you were exercising? Okay. Yeah, yeah you got that? Yeah. Okay. So what I'd like you to do now, Carrie, is, is you're just thinking about that time when you're exercising. Yeah, you got that? Yeah. 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 And what I'd like you to do is just, can you just tell us a little bit about you exercising? Well, I was just thinking about the, I was exercising this afternoon. So um, I've got some Nordic walking poles and because uh, I had a fall a, a few weeks ago and I twisted my ankle really badly. So I'm, I've got the poles, so I'm stabilised. So I'm, I'm going on rough ground. And um, yeah, so I'm walking along and it's, it's a quite rough, but my ankle's pretty good. And I just had a really lovely walk and I saw a fox and um, I was just walking along and the, the um, I went across the golf course and there was a few people playing golf but I managed to avoid all the golf balls um, and yeah it felt really good actually walking on the rough ground um, as, and it hasn't been it's been really painful um, yeah and I was just noticing um, how much better I'm walking and how much firmer so when I'm putting my feet on the ground it feels like I'm evenly distributing my weight and I'm you know I'm I feel like I'm present and grounded and yeah it feels good it feels really you good. said it 
you said it feels good and you said you could it really feels good so when you say it feels good where, where does it feel good mm, interesting question um I suppose initially it feels good in both feet. So I get a really even feeling in both of my feet. Um, but also I'm just noticing because I'm feeling it, uh, you know, my arms are, yeah, everything sort of feels like it's working better than say a couple of weeks ago when I come back with my arms hurting and my <laughs> ankle hurting. And it just, yeah, I got a sense of more um, rhythm almost like I'm walking it's even you know so I'm feeling as a I'm swinging evenly rather than slightly lame so I'm feeling it really even in my body mm. lovely thank you thank you okay Liana can we switch on, to you me, please um, let me up in and spotlight Liana sorry I don't uh, right hang on spotlight Liana Lovely. Hello, Liana. Hi. So, um, I'm just going to ask you a similar question. So, can you think of a time in the last couple of weeks when you were exercising? Well, uh, I exercised this morning. Um, it's uh, a YouTube video where I'm dancing. I've just got back into trying to dance. And it was interesting because it's my time to have on my own, um, to meditate. I do meditate, dance, then yoga. <laughs> Whether that's the right way, I don't know. And Mia, my daughter, walked in. And usually, um, you know, you'd be a bit frustrated. You know, this is, I've got my time. It's five o'clock in the morning, go to bed. But it was actually really good because she saw me exercising. We had this lovely chat about exercise and what it, how important it is. And yeah, it was really good. So I had a really good morning this morning exercising. Okay. So can you tell me a little bit about what that exercise is? So just staying with your exercise this morning and your dancing. Can you just tell me a bit about what that was like? Uh, it was good. Uh, I felt energized. Um, I am starting to learn the moves. Um, it's a bit of eye candy. <laughs> Don't let my husband see this. <laughs> um, but the guy who does the choreography, he is um, very nice. And the women that he has doing the dancing aren't your usual um you know, size eight models. They're just normal women who have gone on the journey of weight loss and they're not in this video. So, uh, yeah, this is really good. So I'm just going to ask you now, can you, can you just get a sensation of, of what it felt like to, to do that dancing? <laughs> Something mean. <laughs> I'm being so mean to you. I was like, why are you asking? I don't know. <laughs> It felt uh, like painful, I'd say, a bit in, I don't know, in my calves, potentially. Uh. <laughs> you don't know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, gorgeous. So what I'm going to ask you now to do is, can you imagine for a moment that you're going to do some dancing next week? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Or not sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thoroughly I'm loving your head movement. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're making me look silly, Chris. <laughs> No, what I'm loving is thank yous because one of the things that we re it's really interesting is we get so many clues yeah. from what somebody's doing when they're actually accessing it. So what's, what I'm thoroughly loving is when I'm watching you, you're going, next week, mm, no, I can't see next week. So there's something, yeah, there's something really important here for you about putting something into the future when actually I'm not sure I've got the time to do that. 
not sure that mm, can I find that no and what's lovely is watching you look for it mm. so I'm looking to see whether I've got that time and if I have got that time great and if I have no maybe it's not going to work for me Sorry, I'm just seeing all the chats <laughs> They're laughing at me because when I, I, put, oh, no, I put my no. eyes up, I put my eyes up a lot when I was thinking of the instructor, just visualizing. <laughs> it's rather gorgeous, I say. Right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna uh, um, just stop my video for a second because I'm just gonna go and put my light on because I've just looked at mine and it looks absolutely dark. It's suddenly gone really, really dark, so I'm just gonna pop my light on. But if you just want to have a quick look through the chat while I go and put the light on and uh, to see what everybody's just been um, talking about. Um, We've got well. a question. Okay, so we do have a question here about clarifying kinesthetic. Okay. Uh, eye down to left versus auditory digital, eye down to right. Yeah. So um, Chris is going to come back in a second. <laughs> she's going to come back when she's got some light. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, oh, there we go. I'm better. <laughs> um, Yes, so um, if you're talking, so if you're talking to yourself, so auditory digital is talking to yourself. So if, if you guys want to ask me a question, because you'll see it, because I do have a little chat. So our, we're going to talk about my exercise and you'll see me doing auditory digital in a second. So uh, guys, you want to ask me a question? Do you want to talk yeah. about exercise? Can I'll I remember ask, a time? I'll ask you a question if you like. So, um, yeah, can you remember a time when you first started exercising in the last, you know, this period of exercising that you've been doing? Can you remember um, the first time? Yeah, so I started exercising about a couple of weeks ago. And I think one of the, um, one of the things that I found really difficult about um exercising is that um I don't have anybody else to exercise with at the moment so I'm not very good on my own um so I um yeah I I struggle uh being on, exercising on my own because it just doesn't really um it doesn't really suit me um and I'm much much better if I'm going um if I'm, if I'm going to be, if I'm in a class, so um, for example, um, with, uh, with my friend uh, uh, Sharon, that feels much nicer for me than, um, so that, that feels uh, really comfortable when I'm with her. Um, yeah, I feel much better when I'm exercising with somebody else. Um, yeah. Okay, so what did you guys notice yes, about so, me? Yeah. Who are you asking? Yeah. The audience? Yeah, I'm just so I when I'm talking to myself, yes. I go down here, and when and I'm feeling it, I go down there. So it's quite yeah, distinct and you different. You'll you'll notice a difference. And you also don't you go into feeling after quite a while. So yeah. you kind of get it. You. And then eventually you get into, oh, I can feel it now. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to, I have to get the picture. Then I'll have a little chat to myself. Then I'll go into my feelings. So it's almost like I'm, I'm doing a little sort of, um, a, like sort of a triangle. I'm going from there to there to there. But whenever I want to check something out, I'll always have a chat to myself. And you'll notice often with patients when they really want to um, make sure it's going to work for them, they will in fact have a little chat. And what you'll notice them doing is saying, um, I'm not sure that that's going to, um, yeah. Mm. And then you'll, you'll, they're actually responding to themselves in conversation. Okay, so what did we notice then? So if we go back to you, Caro, Hang on. we put you on the screen for a second. Hang on, I'm just spotlight, spotlight you. you. So, those of you who noticed, Caro, she does uh, access an image, so she does go up and have a little look. Um, but what you notice with Caro is she embodies it absolutely. And are those of you who were watching, she's actually doing the movements of walking. So she's 
feeling her walking, she's experiencing it, she's got um, kinesthetic language, so we can hear her talking about the sensation of the ground, what it feels like, what it feels like in her body, um, and she's absolutely, totally living it here and now. So let's just play a little bit with the future, a little bit, see something that you haven't yet talked about. So I'm gonna ask you, Caro, to think about um, what, going for a walk next week. Feels like uh, Monday. Okay, feels like Monday. Yeah, I can see that I'm, I can see, yeah, feels like Monday. Okay. Because, yeah, feels like the weekend's going to be really busy. Uh, okay. Monday, Monday's good, yeah. Okay, so it feels like Monday, hmm. and, and you feel into Monday. Yeah. And I you feel into walking on Monday. So it's half past 11. Okay. So we're going at half past 11, I can feel half past 11 feels free. If I look later on in the day, it's too busy. But, so I can feel that I've got quite a free time in the morning about around half 11. Okay. So get it done before lunch, because, yeah, so I can feel that. Yeah. You can feel that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So you can feel that. Now, when you feel into that yeah, walking... I need to get in my van and go to St. Catherine's <laughs> Hill. That's where I'm walking. Okay. So you can feel yourself... Can you feel yourself getting into the van? Yes, I can. And I must not hit my knee next time. <laughs> okay. So you must not hit your knee next time. So you can feel yourself getting into the van and you can feel yourself driving to St. Catherine's Hill. Yeah, I'm in the car park. I'm getting out of the car. I'm locking the door. I can see the ducks and the water there on the pond. And I can see the ripples of the water. And it's really nice. It's a sunny day. And um, I've got my juice. I'm going up the hill. Yeah, I'm walking up the hill. And... It's really hard work walking up that hill. It's, it's, you, get, you have to stop about three times on the way up. It's really hard work. I'm on the top, I can feel the wind in my hair. And, um, and it's amazing because you've got this incredible view. It's like an amazing view of Winchester and all around. And once you've had that walk, how, how do you feel once you've finished that walk? Really good. I feel really good. I've gone over the top, down the steps, round back round by the river. And it was a really good walk. It feels like I've really stretched myself and I can feel my legs coming where I can come down the hill. I can feel a little bit wobbly because it's such a, you know, it's such a high hill. And when you come down those steps all the way down, it's um, very often after going up the hill, it's like quite legs, the back of your legs can be quite wobbly. Okay. Um, but then, then I've evened that out along the path and I'm back at the van and I'm feeling good because I'm feeling like I've really stretched myself and, mm. and I've, yeah, it's good work. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. Right. Liana, can we have a little, little chat? Hang on. <laughs> Let me do the, the <laughs> spotlighting. There we go. Right. Hello. Hi. Now you've talked about wanting to put some exercise into your daily routine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is turn into a coaching counsellor. <laughs> yeah. So I would love you to think about for a moment how you could imagine, just from imagine for a moment, that you um, are going to start thinking about putting some exercise into your daily routine or weekly routine? Daily is fine, yeah. Daily? Okay. So I'd just like you for a moment to think about your day and to think about when you might be able to imagine yourself doing some exercise. Well, this is actually an easy question <laughs> for a shade um, because I've already got it in, in my routine. So okay. I get up 6 a.m. I put on my clothes and I do it till 7 and then I get Mia up for school. So that's my time. Um, I've also started walking 
um, to school and back with her. So again, that, that's allowing me to get my steps in. Um, and that's my only time. I can't see any other time in the day that I could do it. And when you see that time in the day, what's that like for you? Um, it's very structured. So it's like, a, it's like, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. And it's, <laughs> it's almost the only way to survive. <laughs> There's so many things to do that you have to just block the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for you, it's really important to block the time to have that time so that it feels like it's like this, you, you can, it's, yeah, yeah? it's in a yeah. sequence. Oh. oh, and you tick it off. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Everything I have to do, and I like to, <laughs> it's so predictable, I like to see it getting ticked off um, or crossing out. Right. So if I see the everything crossed out on my to-do list, I feel like high-fiving myself. <laughs> so as long as you're seeing everything ticked off, yeah. And it's in a sequence. Mm -hmm. So for you, exercise, it has to come in a sequence. It had to be fitted in. You yeah. can tick it off your list. Job done. High five. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So guys, as you can see, two completely different ways of experience. We'll take, we'll take you off the spotlight now, Liana. <laughs> yeah. But we're all going to be expecting next week. Did she do her exercise? Yeah, did she do it? Yeah, did she do it? Um, but as we can see, guys, the very, very different ways of actually um, a structuring how they do exercise, but also how they're experiencing. So, Caro, you can really, um, when you're watching her, she's embodying it, she's feeling it, and she's even saying it feels like next Monday. Whereas for Liana, I have to see a gap. In my, in my schedule, six o'clock, that's what I can see. I can fit that in there and I'm going to tick that off. Whereas you've got Caro who's saying, feels like Monday and I can feel myself doing it. And yeah, and I can feel how I feel once I've actually experienced the exercise. So the important thing as me as a therapist um, and as a coach is that my language changes and how I work with my clients changes according to their preferences. So with Liana, we're gonna do structure, everything comes in a sequence, and we're gonna do lots of visual language and we're gonna really help her to imagine. And with, with Caro, we're going to help her feel it and access the emotions that she or the sensations that she experiences with me you're going to have to find out whether i'm actually happy having a little chat to myself and whether i've actually decided it's going to work for me or not and then i'll feel whether it feels right and then i'll likely to do the exercise so that is a whistle stop tour ladies and gentlemen of um mapping um, and with some lovely examples. And we'll be doing a whole lot more in some of our other webinar series. So Liana, you're on questions. Okay, so yeah, we have um, B. Marella um, has been asking quite a few really great questions. Um, so we have for a client who needs to be reflective, yeah. how can we know how long to wait for their processing before we give a further question or input? How do we know if they're being reflective versus if they are stuck and need more guidance? Okay, my experience is you'll watch, and depending on where the person is, my experience is that people, you watch them and they kind of, they'll come back into eye contact with you. So for me, if I'm, for example, when I'm reflecting, I might take a moment and then I'll come back. So, and it's, I always check with somebody and say, are you ready to move on or to chat anything? Have you had enough time they have or they haven't um and then you can just give them more, more time or, or less time um but my experience is that they they show you in their physicality when they they come back cool um that's all the questions we have brilliant wow well, um and we were actually at the end so brilliant thank yeah. you no, thank you, Chris. That was amazing. Um, really, really informative, interactive. I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I'll actually wait there. We've got another question. Oh. One question. We can fit it in. Is it ever important to guide a client towards a processing style, which is not their mapped preference? For example, if someone is visual, might it be important to move them to feeling? 
no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to say to you, don't bother yeah. because it will throw them. So if, if I try now to move Caro into auditory and I try to get her to listen to something, the response I'm going to get is she's going to be overwhelmed. So it's, we've least practiced, we don't use it. And so it's, it's, if you like, it's a muscle that we don't have the, um, the capacity to use particularly well. So I'd go, no. The thing I would say is be aware of our own learning style and how we sometimes try and persuade others to learn in the way that we do. Don't do it, just be flexible and work with their style. And I think as we get to the end, what I would say is this is a taster session for all of um, the people that have attended. And if you want to deep dive more, we'll be offering courses as part of our offer where you can deep dive into this subject a lot more um, and in, expand your, your learning. So I really want to thank Chris um, for an amazing webinar and also for Caro and myself for being... <laughs> interrogated <laughs> for, for the I just end. want to say a deep big thank you because you two are amazing and I've and actually learned what I've really <laughs> learned is some great stuff about both of you which I hadn't paid much attention to before so uh, I'm clocking that and noting it particularly Caro how you really embody yeah. something is beautiful and I did put that in the chat that um we we didn't know the questions beforehand so we were this <laughs> it was a true reaction yeah <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Just to, yeah, go on, Karen. Yeah, and I just wanted to say goodbye as well. And um, yes, come and have a look at our website. Come in and join our community. It'd be fabulous to see you in there if you're not already in it. And as Liana says, let's do some deep diving together. So thank Brilliant. you. Thank Good you. Night.